Welcome again, everyone, to the philosophy of art and science. As always, if you support this program, these programs, head over to the YouTube channel and join directly, or you can at various levels, or you can go to patreon.com slash aksum. Today, we have a returning guest, Deacon Salomon Cabrier. Uh, welcome back to the program. Last time we uh, got into your beautiful biographical details, and so people could go check out the last one to see who you are in case there are still people out there who don't know because they need to know. I don't know why they don't know yet. And today I wanted to focus on a project that you were kind of directly involved, but let's say more tangentially involved with. And then one that is, of course, that you're you're leading and another one you're associated with as well. So I saw you promoting Grandpa Was an Emperor on Facebook. And then it was like, uh, it's like being in a, in a movie because then shortly after I got to go see it when it came to Los Angeles and it was involved in the African Film Festival on uh, on the theater on uh, the historic theater in Crenshaw and King in a historically black area of LA so it was great and I don't know a ton about the director Constance Marks or the executive producer Cynthia Irvo and Salome Williams although that that name did catch my eye I was like is she is she have a shot I don't know you maybe you'll tell me but I know you have a connection to Princess Yeshikasa, the great granddaughter of Haile Selassie. So could you could you talk about what this movie was about and how how you have any connections to it? And then we can take it from there. Sure. Thank you, Deacon. And uh, it's very good to be back on your podcast. Um, yeah, just to jump right in, uh, Grandpa it Was an Emperor is a documentary that was uh, created uh, around the story of, of Yeshikasa, Mbet Yeshikasa, who's a great granddaughter of Emperor Haile Selassie of Ethiopia. And it covers the story um, of the imperial family and, and, and how, in particular, the family of Princess Sabla Desta and Dejazmach Kasa of Damariam, who uh, Princess Sabla is the granddaughter of Emperor Haile Selassie, is Yeshi's mother. And uh, Dajazmach Kasao Damariam is Ishi's father, and he's a member of the um, Oromo aristocracy of, of Wadlegga, um, which wow. has been on the news a lot lately. Yes. Um, I didn't so, realize he was from Wadlegga. I, yes, I knew he was involved he, somewhere, but. Yeah, yeah. no, um, the, he is from the, um, the he's the d descendant of Dajazmach Jyoti, who was the uh, ruler of the princely state of Kalam in, in, in Wadlegga. Um, you, you, there were several um, monarchical states in the Gibbe River Basin, um, which were Oromo monarchical states. A lot of the time we, we, we associate um, Oromo um, society with this uh, Gada um, uh, philosophy and, and system. But where the Oromos had moved from a pastoralist type of society to an agricultural society, they actually developed monarchies. Um, Jimma is probably the most famous one. They had a sultan. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the states of Nekab and Jotewar were, were in Wadlegga, and uh, they, uh, they were also hereditary monarchies. Um, so Dejazmach Kasa al Damariam was the heir to the to Dejazmach Jyoti, to the, uh, to the princely state of Kalam. And he married in Pride Selassie's granddaughter by Princess Tananyort, Princess Sabda Desta. And, um, you know, aside from the ancestry, etc., Dejazmach Kasa was very highly regarded. He was a, um, he was, he had a huge reputation for being a very hard worker. Um, he served as the Empress private secretary for a while. He was the president of Addis Ababa University um, during a very critical time when the student movement was, was gearing up. Uh, he was also the Minister of Agriculture when the uh, famine in Wadlo happened. So, you know, he was involved in very critical um, uh, points of the uh, revolution right before, right at the very tail end of the monarchy and the rise of uh, the revolution and the Dark regime. So uh, basically, this documentary, which was uh, produced by uh, Connie Marx and um, Constance Marx, and Corinne uh, Lepouk, uh, who uh, were um, a, a very dynamic um, team of people who uh, previously, um, 
produced a, a very highly regarded uh, documentary by the name of um, uh, Being Elmo, um, which is, you know, award-winning, very famous documentary. And uh, they, they, um, they took on this project, which follows Yeshi as she looks back um, at a very tumultuous time in Ethiopian history, um, the revolution of 1974, and explores what happened to her parents, what happened to her relatives, and in a broader sense, what happened to Ethiopia and the society uh, that existed in that country in 1974, and you know what are the repercussions? And it's a very, it's a very powerful documentary. Uh, you you've seen it. Um, I know that I, I've seen it a couple of times. I I, I consulted on on historic uh, topics with the. Um, with the production team, uh, I have a small cameo in the film as well. It's a great uh, scene. Talk about that. That's a great scene. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so you know, uh, yes, she's yes, she's a very dear friend. Um, uh, the the uh, she's uh, she's very outspoken. She's very outgoing. She's a, a very lively person. And uh, part of of uh, as you've seen, part of her quest was she wanted to speak to senior Doug members to see. You know what their perspective was. You know, did they know? Um, you know, what did they know, and and why did they do what they did? Uh, in particular, to her family, to people like her mother, who spent fourteen years in prison. Uh, her mother was not a political figure; she was a princess, but she was, you know, she, she wasn't a government official, um, and she was basically thrown in prison uh, with with her other relatives simply for being who she was, and. Um, and yes, she wanted an explanation from someone in the know. Um, so she went on a quest to 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 find Mengistu to speak to former President Mengistu Hadamaria. And um, my 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 one little cameo was that I, I I asked her, you know, what what would you get out of speaking to Mengistu? And she gave me a very succinct answer. She was closure. She wanted closure. Um, I encourage people to see this film, um, because it, it's not just about the perspective of a member of the imperial family, um, but it's about what happened and, and uh, um, you know, how, how that affects who we are today and with the situations we go through today. Um, you know, there's, there's a, there's a uh, you know, a very powerful account um, about all these people who, who, you know, were were imprisoned and executed. Um, people that are, you know, now in exile who, you know, had to leave their country, and the whole, the whole, uh, the whole experience of separation from from the society that that gave birth to you, and and how that feels and how that develops. Um, a lot of people find uh, the whole involvement of. Uh, Bob Marley in in this story to be very interesting as well, yes. and the role he played in in helping some members of the imperial family escape, uh, and all the other people who were involved in the escape of some of the royal children from from Ethiopia. Um, so yeah, it's 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 an excellent film. Um, it there's a lot of buzz around it. They are in the process of uh, trying to work out wider distribution for it. So far, it's only been seen on the. Um, you know, it was at the uh, NYC Doc uh, Film Festival here in New York, um, and it was shown on the West Coast uh, as well. So, you know, um, it was streamed very briefly when it was uh, here in New York uh, online. Um, so it, it's been seen by a very limited audience so far. But to those of you who are able to see um, any viewings that are coming up, I really encourage you to go see it, and I uh, encourage you to tell others about it because it, it is a very powerful film and it's very timely i think as well um considering everything that's happening in ethiopia today uh it, it it's a really a look back to you know where a lot of these issues uh began absolutely I, even as you're talking about it again now like i started to tear up because throughout almost i'd say 90 percent of the documentary like i was just i was just crying off off camera, I told you how um, I know several people, and you probably know even more people, whose direct parents, either you know their father or whatever, were executed in the first group, executed in the second group, 
you know, mass graves, the, the various aristocrats. And it, it just seems mindless, chaotic, without reason. I mean, it's a real somber look at how much harm and damage was caused to the 3000 year old Ethiopian society. And I think even the impetus that she says in the documentary is that she felt a lot of the accounts so far, because they have some sort of, I don't know whether it's left leaning political uh, affiliation or some sort of sympathy for getting rid of an absolutist monarchy that it itself was in some sense, you know, constitutional, at least they had a couple constitutions. They weren't still running the Futa Nagasta as it was That's correct. or the law of Kings. So there were some, although some people just say it was still absolute, but it's almost like absolute monarchy is so indigestible to them that they think whatever harms the communist or the, the dead, the military junta had, that it was a sort of necessary historical moment. And there, there seems to be, apologies or defenses of it set up by so many people to this day and then with the onset of the pseudo-ethnic linguistic politics of the tplf that is still affecting us to this day it seems that people are saying well weren't the dead better because at least they weren't separating people by ethnicity and so it seemed the impetus was to kind of tell a different story so i wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that aspect of it, about telling like a different point of view. And then talk a little bit more about your scene to, on a more lighthearted note, because you, you know, it's great. You were consulted for history. You're not a professional historian, but you you have such a great grasp of history, but then you also take on this role as like friend, mentor, therapist, which was amazing to, uh, to see and, and, and Godspeed to them. I, I hope they get Netflix or Disney or whatever the largest, you know, Amazon, HBO, whatever the largest distributor is. I hope they get it. But I honestly think that they could do great in this day and age with direct sales. And I'll help with all whatever medium, whatever small following I have, I'll point everyone to go buy that film and spread it as much as possible. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, I'll pass that on to the producers who are, you know, wonderful people. Um, but um, yeah, you know, it's interesting that, that you that you brought, you know, the point, uh, that point up about um, the, the, uh, the belief that somehow uh, the Derg was better than um, the ethnicist um, regimes that have come since, uh, and that uh, somehow the, the Derg was a necessary change to move us from an absolute monarchy, um, because you know, actually, I, I had a little bit of a uh, exchange on on uh, a Facebook post that I posted today um, uh, with someone, you know, uh, you know, young lady, very very intelligent, uh, you know, thinking person, who who uh, said, you know, basically, you know, the the the, the tumult that we saw, the 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 unrest, the 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 loss of life was something to be expected um, because it was necessary to get rid of, you know, what she described as as a as a bad system. So, you know, first I, I take exception to the the idea that the Ethiopian monarchy was an was an absolute monarchy. Mm -hmm. I don't really think there are absolute monarchies in the world. Um, every uh, institution, every monarchy, at least um, that I know of. Uh, is subject to rules. Um, and the Ethiopian monarch was not absolute. He did not have final say. Um, you know, he, 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 he was the ruler, but he was constrained by traditional and religious laws. Um, they might not have been written, but he, you know, he, he, was, he, he had limits to his power. Uh, an emperor of Ethiopia could not change his religion and comfortably stay on his throne. Um, <laughs> there have been a couple who tried and yeah. it didn't work. Uh, an emperor of Ethiopia had obligations. He had obligations uh, and he, he, he was administered an oath um, to provide justice to his people. So, you know, whether he, you know, a, an emperor was successful or that, uh, at that or not is, it's, it's, you know, a matter for people to discuss. 
but yeah. there were obligations and there were responsibilities. Um, and he couldn't just do whatever he liked. Um, so the idea that a monarchy is absolute, you know, it's, it's, it's not quite correct, uh, in my view anyway. Um, and as far as, you know, you know, it being a good thing and a good change, I, I think you can see, you know, the, 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 that type of thinking in this documentary. I think there's a part where she actually mentions how people have told her, especially, you know, some, she, she spoke to a lot of people uh, in the documentary and, and, and particularly in some intellectual circles. The view was, you know, her father as, as, um, as president of the university was a very respected person um, and is still a very respected person. He, there are those who, who say he was probably the best university uh, uh, president uh, of uh, Addis Ababa or in Price Lassie University that the university ever had. Um, but those same people will, would, would, would say things to her like, oh, we really, really liked your father. He was such a wonderful fi uh, person. Uh, but we just, you know, we didn't like your mother and we didn't like your mother's family. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it just goes to show me that that dislike was not based on anything factual because um, uh, for those who know Princess Sebla, um, you know, she's a princess, uh, but she's probably one of the most down to earth people I've ever met and, and, and very kind and very generous and uh, a, a person who worked really hard to, um, y to support charitable and cultural efforts within Ethiopia. So not a person that was going around doing, you know, terrible things or living an ostentatious life, um, but someone who, who, who worked uh, to, to better the lot of her people. So um, the dislike is clearly a political dislike. Um, and uh, it, it's not based on anything personal, but it's ideological. And that's what I have a, you know, a, a very, significant problem with. Um, I think a lot of the dislike of what happened, um, you know, before the revolution, a, the, a lot of the rhetoric about um, imperial Ethiopia that is negative is based purely on, on, on propaganda and, and ideology. It's not based on any real knowledge of, of the system, of how things were. Now, I'm not saying the system was perfect. No system is perfect. Mm -hmm. And there are clearly, you know, things that needed to change and improvements that could have been made uh, and and abuses that needed to be ended. But I don't think um, that the, the the larger view of 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 what that system was is is entirely accurate. Um, but you know i I think you know uh, when you go back, um, and, and and you consider this question of whether the Derg was better than um, the EPRDF or um, the Prosperity Party and their respective governments. Um, you you have to you, you have to look at it um, in in as a progression. I think mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of the beliefs and and uh, the assumptions in government today have the root in the dark. Um, they carried them out in very different ways. Um, but the idea of, of, of ethnic politics, although it wasn't the basis uh, for Dark rule, you do see its germination there. Um, there was an idea of a persecuting upper class ethnicity that was introduced during the Dark regime. Uh, but they didn't. They didn't really push that as hard as they pushed Marxism, Len Leninism, and and uh, 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 you know Soviet-style communist uh, system that they were aspiring for t towards. Um, but um, a lot of the revolutionary ideals uh, that came out of the Derg and out of other leftist movements like the EPRP and, and other political movements you know, germinated and developed into the ethnic politics we see today. Um, I think the entire spectrum of Ethiopia's active political parties now, the vast majority, have their root in these 
leftist movements that germinate from the Ethiopian student movement, um, which Dejaz Machkaza was confronted with in, that, in uh, the university, Prize Lessi, the first university. Um, and I think <clears throat> those ideas that, that, that began there are what led to the revolution, led to the Bedouk coming to power, led to the rise of the TPLF and the PRDF and you know and from that comes prosperity. So I think there's definitely um, a family tree that goes back um, in a way that's just as dynastic as say Solomonic family tree uh, or the Zagwe family tree. Uh, but this is an ideological family tree that passes mm -hmm. that you can see and you can link them all the way back to a common source. Um, at least that's my belief. I think I think so too, and I think um, I think it was uh, Hermed Aragawi recently had a TPLF defector from the early days, and uh, but he was someone who was a guerrilla fighter with them, and he talked about how they kind of did what students in high school and college do today: they copy and pasted the Marxist-Leninist ideology. But they changed, you know, they used synonyms and they they said instead of, you know, chauvinist, instead of class, let's use an ethnicity based off of linguistics and, um, you know, let's favor our side more. And instead of the chauvinist, let's say the Amhara. But there's an interesting parallel there. You have obvious exceptions within the aristocracy, like you've mentioned, the Oromo speaking family of the Jazmach Kasa. There is the Tigrinya speaking family of the Jazmach Salomon, but we can say in large part the aristocrats so happened to be Amharic speakers natively, and a lot of them, you know, showins by by virtue of the dynasty that was in or the, the line of the House of Solomon that was in power at the time. Would you say that's a pretty fair analysis? Like consequential, like by virtue of who is being affected in, in that sense? I think that's, <clears throat> that's, that's pretty fair. Um, but we, you know, I think, um, you know, we, we also have to take into account um, that there was no sense of uh, ethnic purity that's been introduced uh, in recent years, you know, people um, have been asked to identify their their um, ethnicity, and, uh, and and it's very hard to do so, particularly in the Ethiopian in the old Ethiopian aristocracy, mm -hmm. where intermarriage between elites was very common. Um, the, the Emperor High Selassie's uh, children and grandchildren married into various. Um, you know, noble families from various ethnic groups. Um, Adejaz Machkasa being, you know, the most, you know, the one that we've just been discussing from Kalam, but the other big Oromo kingdom from Wallag, uh, from Wallaga, which was Nagamt, produced Adejaz uh, Mach, Fikra Selassie Habtamariam, who was married to Princess Ejiga uh, Yawaswa Wasen, and uh, uh, Prince Haile Selassie, Haile Selassie, Emperor's youngest son, was married to Dajjal Majfik as Selassie's elder sister, Princess Mahasanta, who's you know still with us. Um, Crown Prince Aswawasan was married to Princess Walat Israel initially, who was the grand, uh, great granddaughter of Emperor Johannes IV, who was Tigrayan. So you have all these um, these marriages between elites, and and the the <clears throat> going all the way back. Um, uh, Empress Leni was from Hadiya. Um, she was probably yeah. the, the, the biggest, the most prominent um, dowager empress in Ethiopian history, sent the first Ethiopian embassy to, to, to Europe to ask for assistance against the, the rise of, of the, uh, the Muslim sultanates who were trying to overthrow the Christian monarchy. Um, you know, and that um, was, was she the wife of Emperor Zerayakob? Yes, she was. Yes, she yeah. was. And so she, 1300s, 1400s? Yes, uh, 1400s. And she she served as Dowager Empress. You know, she she had no children of her own, um, at least that we know of. But, um, you know, her, her stepson, uh, Damariam, uh, gave her the role. His mother had died. He, he, he gave her the role of Queen Mother, which was a very powerful um, role in those days. Um, and then she served not just in, during his reign, but she was the elder statewoman, uh, the dowager empress, 
uh, not just for Be'da Maryam, but for uh, as a Na'ud and uh, as a Libna Dingle as well. Uh, so she, she was, you know, a very powerful, very prominent figure in Ethiopia. And she was from, uh, you know, an ethnicity outside of, you know, the, 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 the Christian Amhara Tigrayan core of, of the empire in those days. Um, and there were others. Um, there was a lot of intermarriage uh, between elites. And so, and it's not just in the aristocracy, but even, you know, if you, if you go into rural areas of Shoah, you'll find it very hard to find an Amara farmer that doesn't have at least a little Oromo blood somewhere or, or Goragi mm -hmm. blood somewhere. Um, at, at one point, it was, it was uh, considered, you know, uh, very important for, for, for nobles to, to marry Goragi women because uh, they were relatively unaffected with some of the venereal diseases that were becoming very common in other parts of the highlands. Um, <laughs> they had a better record of, 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 of childbirth, better health, it seemed. So it was a thing to find a Guragi wife um, at, at some point. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's a lot of, uh, there was a lot of intermarriage. There was no sense of ethnic purity, which we're seeing today, where someone is told to identify their ethnicity um, and and to uh, exclude others, to 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 see other ethnicities living around you as not belonging. If you're an or Oromo living in Oromia, you feel like, oh, all these other ethnicities are just visitors. This is not their home. Uh, they could have been there for generations, and it's an, it's not just in Oromia that this is going on. It's happening, you know, in other areas as well, where people have been told this is your ethnic enclave. So all these other people don't really belong here, which is is ne has never has never been the case in Ethiopian history before. Uh, people were able to live wherever they were ruled by whoever ruled over that area, uh, regardless of you know what ethnic city they were or what ethnicity that local ruler was, um, and could expect to be protected and have the same rights as their neighbors, um, whatever they were. So you know. That has that is a definite big change, um, and I think it's a direct result of of what happened in 1974. Yeah, well said. I remember when I had it's so funny actually. I met another deacon about a week or two ago, and I'm much older than him, so I had met him several years ago, and he had forgotten that he met me in the church, but he had known me from one of my audio recordings of my English translation, as well as the Amharic original of Emperor Minilik's rebuke or admonition towards Abajifar of Jimma, that Oromo monarchical city-state that you're talking about. And yeah, I, I read a while back, and it, that, that rebuke brief, briefly was about him enslaving people from Janjiro and not letting them pass through his domain like anyone should be able to move throughout any of the domains of any of the the lesser governors of the larger ethiopian empire and for the minilik's point and, and the reason i translate in the first place is when people try to paint him as hitler and then you get you know mountains of evidence like this of him reaching out for some other ethnicity that he really didn't have to do for the sake of you know what you could call human rights way before there were human rights as as a part of our lexicon like just basic sort of human dignity just don't go around capturing people let them rest and stay wherever they want to as long as you know they're still within the empire but that that type of thing is gone and it reminds me of my reading of uh, Asmarom Lagasa's book, uh, Oromo Democracy, about the system of the Gada. And in that book, it details how you you mentioned how they went from pastoralists to agriculturalists. And it's basically, it seems, the more north kind of they went on the north-south axis, the more they had to acculturate to the mores of the people, like you said. Like a lot of them, sometimes by necessity, but sometimes out of their own will, or you could say political savviness, become Orthodox Christian, uh, become monarchists and integrate and intermarry and have have no sense of ethnic purity in the way that it, it is said now. And 
it's strange to to see that now but getting back to the film when you were in this sort of uh, therapist role you were giving your own kind of stern admonition and rebuke my interpretation and you can tell me what the case is is that because there was so much madness and chaos in this communism that begins in 1974 and then has its children in the all the regimes till now and and, and whose system has still not been uprooted for the historical system uh, although there have been several regime changes it seems that you didn't find it fruitful to speak to co uh, colonel i was about to say colonel uh, <laughs> colonel mangustu or to you know fisaha desta or i don't know uh, like any of any of the higher ranking members of the of the Derek, did you did you find that not to be fruitful conversation or yeah. you know would you interview them on on Yatari Kamba, which we'll talk about later? You know that's a that's a that's a very that's a very good question as to whether I would interview them. I would I would probably be willing to interview them to ask them about their period of history. You know what they experienced as far as you know um, uh, ruling Ethiopia during that time. Uh, but as to, you know, um, their culpability in, in what happened mm -hmm. to, to the emperor and his family and, and for the atrocities that happened, um, you know, whether it's the Red Terror or the response to the, you know, horrific famine in, in, in the mid 80s, um, I, I, I didn't think that it was fruitful. Um, you know, I, uh, you, you saw in the film where I, where I say to, to Yeshi, you know, well, what are you going to get out of speaking to Mengistu? Uh, what, what do you think you'll get? And she, she, you know, her perspective was that she wanted closure, but my, my feeling was, um, you're not there. You're not going to get what you need from them, which is an answer. Um, mm -hmm. they are either going to refuse to speak to you. Um, which ultimately was what happened, um, or you, they'll they'll um, they'll lie, um, or they'll deny any responsibility. Uh, th there's a famous interview with um, uh, ex President Mengistu where he says he wouldn't hurt a fly uh, or an insect. <laughs> um, you know, for those of us who who lived through that period, we know that's patently not true. You know, we the uh, we we saw horrible things happening all around us, um, but I uh, my feeling was the effort um, on her part, while you know laudable, you know it's, it's it's a good thing to want answers and and to seek them out, but I didn't think it would be fruitful, and I thought uh, in a sense that it was a waste of time, um, but it wasn't for her. Uh, yes, she wanted closure and the. The answer that they were not, you know, so and so is not willing to speak to you in itself was an answer for her. Um, so I, I, I guess it helped her. I guess it helped her. Um, I'm, I'm the, the the process of making the film was grueling. Uh, you see it, the toll that it took on her personally as you watch the the film. It was not an easy film to make. It was not an easy um, story to go back and look at. Um, but I think there's a lot of value in 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 in, in posing the questions that she did, uh, and and trying to find answers, many of which were not easy for her. Um, but you know, uh, you know, one of the things that made me very happy was you know the level of participation of her mother, um, Princess Sabla, is, is shown several times um, speaking about her experiences, and I'm glad that that happened. Um, the, the imperial family have been very quiet. They, they really haven't spoken about their experiences or how they felt about what happened. They've been very quiet. And for some members to come forward and, and, and pose these questions, uh, it's, it's very useful for the rest of us who you know, are today dealing with, with, with what's happened since. Um, because a lot of, like I said, a lot of the things that we're going through today find their root and things that happened, uh, in the past, in the recent past. But, uh, yeah, you know, it, one of the things that I, that I really appreciated about the film was the number of people that appear in it, uh, and, 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 and voice their experiences, um, 
we, you know, before they, you know, before they pass away. I mean, a lot of these people are older now. There are people in that film who have passed away since the film was made. Princess Sofia, Princess Zuriash, uh, where's Rowena Van Der Gacho, All these people that you see in these Professor films. Uh, yeah, yes. Um, and, you know, it's uh, a lot of them have gone. And um, it's it's uh, it's really important to get those narratives uh, from them before before they depart. Um, and I think this film goes a long way in doing that. 100%. Professor Haile Gerima, when he was, um, he still hasn't released it yet, but he was working and showing a working version of his World War II film, particularly on the Second Italian Ethiopian War area. Um, <laughs> his own father, an ex priest who does wonderful Zema, <laughs> there's a Z- him yeah, doing yeah, Zema yeah. Uh, yeah, or a melody, yeah. singing church music on a hill, and yeah. then uh, is also this famous playwright, is also this warrior. Uh, but he gave that advice to all of the creatives in the audience. And I was in the audience at the time saying that to record that. And so on my biblical podcast, I have a short recording of the monk who baptized me Mm -hmm. and, uh, he and I actually served together for a few years. He was the Abamanit or the abbot of the Debra Abbai historic mm-hmm. monastery yeah 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 uh, the the school of liturgy yes. uh, certification in yes. ethiopia yeah and he was placed at my parish in los angeles by abuna paulos the fifth patriarch yes uh someone associated yeah, yeah <laughs> with yeah. the regime yeah but he had none of the failings of people associated with the regime totally eschewed ethno-linguistic politics and not only was he at by for 30 years he was at my church for 30 years alongside me from when i was a baby in his hands to serving in the uh, sanctuary with him and then he spent the last two years of his life back at the rabbi where he's currently buried and uh it's, you know it's so sad obviously that where he is is kind of ground zero for the the right. war going yeah. on but yeah. you know um professor tadessa tamrat in his magnum opus, Church and State of Ethiopia, 1270 to the to the 1500s, he has this approach to history, which I really appreciate. As far as I understand, it seems like all the 20th century greats uh, in Ethiopian writing all have some connection to the church. Oh, yeah. And he's one true. of them. And his father, I think it was Professor Getacho Haile, who said his father considered him illiterate until he studied Kuni or G's grammar. And so he had to go and study G's grammar at Debra Libanos Monastery in Shoa before, uh, which is in today's Oromia region, before heading back to the university to do his studies. It's not clear to me, and maybe you know otherwise, it's not clear to me, maybe he was caught by the spirit of the age, that he was still a deacon and still an active believer by some of the things I've read. But it seems that he wanted none of the theology of the Gedlat or the hagiographies, but he seems to be the first person to gather all the hagiographies and read between the lines of what are the historical facts that they are letting on wittingly and unwittingly. And it seems that you would not look to the senior communist officials to give you fruits of repentance, but you would kind of let them speak and be able to glean maybe what other information we couldn't glean otherwise without their firsthand accounts. So you, you, is that is that a fair shake? The way he approached the Gedlat is how you would <laughs> approach the communist leadership. Yeah, I think I think that's uh, I think that's a very valid uh, approach. Um, I think you can learn a lot between the lines of what uh, Doug officials um, say and and write. Um, I, I I think you'll see in the film, you know, they uh, at one point yes, she asked me, you know, of all the du- books that have been written by by mm-hmm. Doug members, you know, which one do you think is a good book? Um, and I said uh, Fasad Dasta's book. Um, I think, uh, you know, Fasad Dasta was was very um, uh, forthcoming in comparison to some of the other Doug members uh, who, who have written books, I thought his book was, was fair, you know, was, was a good one in that it was, um, it provided uh, useful information and, 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 and a little bit of uh, their perspective. I, I think he was, you know, he, he tried his best to give an 
honest um, uh, uh, rendition of, of their experiences and their rise to power and, and, and their experiences there. Um, so yeah, I think there is a lot to learn from, from them. Um, and uh, I, as far as Professor uh, Tadessa Tamarat, um, I don't know, uh, but I do suspect that he was a deacon. And I, I believe, you know, for, for for many people of that generation, that was a norm. Um, uh, a, a lot of the people who who went on to higher education, particularly in in, in religious, uh, but not just religious, but a variety of, of fields. Um, it did start off in the church and and uh, were ordained uh, as deacons. Um, I, I know a few cases personally of people who, you know, prominent medical people, scientists, and so on, were very, very, uh, you know, very devout people of faith. Uh, did they you know. endure though? My my impression is that a lot of them teetered off and what i am always you know this is now contour dasi but what i'm always proud of in you is in all of these efforts that you're doing you're still as far as i know an active servant of the lord and you Thank don't you. i don't um, think it's that common uh i i think it's more common than you than, than you realize um okay. you know just just from my personal um experience uh professor astat Waldeyes, for example um mm -hmm. you know widely respected surgeon um you know very prominent in in his field in the medical field in ethiopia and you know later a political leader of note um with the alamara people's movement um every every time he he went to surgery before he went into surgery he had a chapel with the with an icon of the virgin mary where he wow. would pray before every single surgery every wow. single surgery uh he was very devout um uh, Professor Nebiat Tafari, who is a very, very, very close friend of my father's um, from childhood, um, you know, was, was uh, I, th there are bishops today who, who do not know as much as Professor Nebiat Tafari knew as far as dogma and liturgy and, and religious practice. I mean, he was, he was astounding. Um, he was a very devout and he, he was a very prominent pediatrician he was a children's doctor he was a scientist he studied abroad and these men you know went to church every week they when the Doug forbade driving and so on on Sundays they would walk to Holy Trinity Cathedral from their respective neighborhoods my, my dad would start near Caranio Medanelem and you know he'd walk up to Mexico Square and Dr. Nebiat would be waiting for him there and they'd walk past the, the coffee board and and pick up Professor Asrat and they'd go up Fitbar all the way up to Holy Trinity Cathedral. They passed a whole bunch of churches to get to Holy Trinity Cathedral. Um, and, and they would listen to liturgy at Holy Trinity Cathedral. And, you know, Professor Asad had a little bit of a, a heart issue, so he was very into exercise and so on. So he, what he would do was when my dad and Professor Nabiat uh, and, and, and their friend Atul uh, Sama and others would go into Holy Trinity Cathedral um, for Kidan, he would continue his walk up to Eskazunal Medhan um, kiss the gates, and then come back um, for the exercise. So kiss the gates, and then come Beautiful. back for liturgy at, at Holy Trinity. So, you know, these these were people who were very devout, but were, you know, modern men of modern society in very scientific fields. Um, so, you know, I, I, think, I think there was a larger percentage than people realize of these people who grew up you know, in traditional households, but went into very modern scientific uh, fields, but who continued uh, in their devotions in their own ways um, and were very devout. So I think I think it's a lot more common than a lot of people realize. I love to hear that. And I love to be shown wrong in that regard. And I always want to highlight people like that, especially the, the science one is very interesting because I think it takes a humanity's mind to be excellent in religion and so when you see a scientific mind who also has that they have the best of of both worlds we don't have to get into it if you don't want to but is dr nebiat also the one from that young video uh in america yes, abroad yes, that yes, people, that, that, people yeah, share yeah, that was him that was, him. That was can you it. can you talk about that because that's related i think to some of the agitprop that people have in demonizing the monarchy 
uh, and and thinking that there's a certain pervasive view at that time versus the enlightened views of communism and the children of the communists intellectually. So um, I, I, there are actually two videos. There was one video which had Professor Neviat where he was, um, you know, a very young uh, Professor Neviat with uh, people from other countries here in the U.S. and they were on some quiz show. Uh, then there was another video with the same quiz show with another young Ethiopian that said something extremely controversial. Now, um, what I think Professor Neviat had said, if I if I recall correctly, was something about Ethiopians being um, um, uh, Ethiopian Jews or be descendant of 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 of, of ancient Jews, something along those lines. What the other young man, then a young man, he's he's still alive, the other person, um, who, who he said that Ethiopians were not black, um, which was the big controversy uh, and, and caused such a big uproar um, uh, in, in, in the larger world. So the... the uh, in the moment that we're experiencing now, and in, in right this uh, post George Floyd yes, America, right? Especially people, you know people digging up these old videos, not necessarily at the time, and 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 it, it the, these videos came to light in a very in a very volatile time, n not just in Ethiopia but here as well, with the whole um, you know um, racial strife that we've seen in recent years. Uh, you know the the the. the, the the police brutality allegations and the and the Black Lives Matter movement, together with the ethnic problems back home, these videos coming out have have been pretty explosive. Um, but uh, we have to look at these 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 videos in through the eyes of the periods in which they were filmed. Um, these were filmed in the 1950s. Uh, civil rights was not even a thing in the U.S. Uh, Ethiopia was one of a handful of independent African countries. Um, so the way people thought and the way people um, uh, approached life was very different from what it is today. Thinking was different. Um, and, you know, I, I don't think either of those young men would deny that Ethiopia was African. Um, but, but racial identity politics was a whole different thing in 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 the 1950s in the early 1950s um so i think you know a lot of the the the, the blowback from those videos was was more of people uh looking at history you know events in history through the prism of you know 2020 something um and it isn't really really a very valid way to look at things. I mean, if you if you went up to uh, I, I've said this before, if you went up to Emperor Johannes the Fourth and and tried to uh, talk about um, ethnic politics, um, <laughs> you know the the TPLF, you know a democratic, you know revolutionary uh, socialism or whatever it is that their their ideology is, he'd be perplexed. He would not. This this isn't something Emperor Johannes the Fourth, you know. A native degree and would 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 find you know um, something something that he could digest. Um, but there are people today who will speak out against Emperor Hans the Fourth because of his ethnic identity. People who will speak against Minlik the Second because of his ethnic identity or what they perceive to be his their ethnic yeah. identities. <laughs> so um, you know you you can't look at people in the past with the lenses that you have on your eyes today so uh you you need a new lens uh, not at all well i mean what was Minelik's mother's ethnic identity what is uh emperor johannes's claim to the throne it's certainly his gondarin side yeah uh, yeah he was a, from a cadet line of the gondarin line so you know uh yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh which itself comes from Shoah, comes from beta amhara comes from aksum at the end of the day so what yeah, are we talking yeah. about yeah no that's uh that's very good yeah i think the geneticists and the philologists have been doing their work and they will continue to do their work obviously in one sense Ethiopians are black and in other senses of that term they're not you know there's a lot of hybridity there's a, it's the meeting place of Africa Europe and Asia 
And so there are a lot of influences both in the in the gene pool and in the cultural pool that I think makes for great studies for a lot of people interested in Ethiopian studies and people wanting to get into those controversies can commit themselves to scholarship and share that with us even on this on this channel taking it back to absolutely <laughs> princess uh, sabla i thought one of the great things i can share with you that's unique i don't know how the new york audience was and you had private showings i'm sure but in the la audience we had as i told you it's in the black american area of la a lot of uh, black people i i heard just from the audience with a lot of yes when they saw the eloquence I mean, she may be the best English speaker in the whole movie. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I was a little caught off guard by that at first because I don't know her whole history, but I assumed she's one of the many people educated in England. And I know that becomes a key part of the story that I won't give uh, everything away, but it's also history. So people, you know, there's no real spoiler alerts, but she had deep connections to her schoolmates in, in England, which, which paid off in addition to, you know, people like Bob Marley or uh, Bob Marley. Yeah, um, it's it's very true. But Princess Sevla does have that beautiful um, British accented uh, English, um, and uh, you know, uh, th th there are people who resented um, the emperor's grandchildren, in particular, um, the, you know, the, the Princess Tana York's daughters, for being so English, for being so foreign. Um, but you know, the the realities were. Um, that in 1936, um, fascist Italy occupied Ethiopia. And, you know, to ensure the continuity of the dynasty and the, the existence of a Ethiopian, a legitimate Ethiopian authority, um, the, 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 the council, um, the, the, uh, the governing council of, of, of nobles, et cetera, the, the, the people in, in, in the power circles uh, pushed for the emperor to leave Ethiopia with his family. So the imperial family went into exile um, in Britain and Princess Sabla and her siblings were young children um, when they went to Britain and they were put in you know, the British schooling system uh, and they were there for five years. But you know, uh, I believe Princess Sabla and uh, her uncle, Prince Sahel Selassie were very close in age. Uh, they would have been around five years old um, so imagine going to a country when you're five and uh, staying there till you're 10. And then, you know, once you're there and you're in the schooling system, uh, the, the family goes back to Ethiopia. But, you know, they keep you in your boarding schools there and you go through high school and you come back to Ethiopia. You've you've uh, grown up in, 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 in Great Britain. Of course, you're going to have, you know, a, a, a different view of the world than someone who's never left Ethiopia, right? So, and, and this would probably come across as strange and foreign to, to your average Ethiopian. Um, but the thing about, you know, that I really admire about Princess Sebla and her sisters in particular, but all the imperial family is that they were very hands-on. Uh, Princess Hirut Dasta, who I think deserves a movie of her own, um, was a person who put Lali Bella on the map. Um, she went to Lalibela. She is responsible for, for having, you know, she went to the highway authority and asked them to build a highway to connect Lalibela to the highway network. And wow. the highway authority had other priorities. Um, so she went over their heads to her grandfather and said, this needs to be done because this, she had the idea that this could be a tourist attraction that could bring um, um, income, tourist income to Ethiopia. She brought electricity. She 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 brought electricity to Lalibela. She she built this uh, the the first hotel for tourists in Lalibela, the the Sabatuera or Seven Olives Hotel. Um, she did a lot of things, um, you know, to to to, to promote Lalibela. And she, uh, you know, there's so many interesting stories about her. Uh, Sylvia Pankhurst talks about establishing the first, you know, public library in Addis, and um, she she. He, she was she needed people to help her you know volunteers and princess hirut was one of these people who volunteered wow. to work in the library she was the one person she said that was never late it was always there and if you know there were state functions and so on 
if she had a shift, she would make sure she was at that shift yeah. rather than at any other state function. So, you know, the, the, these are the, these were people who did their best and they were, you know, involved in a lot of charitable uh, uh, efforts, you know, the Cheshire Home, you know, the School for the Blind, uh, the Women's Association, the Jerusalem Association, all these people, all these, you know, royal people uh, actually were very hands-on um, they weren't sitting off in a castle somewhere, you know, shut off from the world, you know, being served. Uh, it was far from it. Um, kindergarten, I was taught by Princess uh, Mary Aswawasan in kindergarten. She was a teacher. Um, it was the crown prince's daughter. Uh, and so, Princess Sophia had her own school that she ran up in, in Toto. Um, so, you know, I think there was a... There was a uh, a disconnect. There were people who just didn't understand uh, where they were coming from because they 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 did attend um, schools in foreign countries, and uh, perhaps people in Ethiopia at the time uh, didn't connect to them with them for, mm -hmm. for that reason. Um, but I think they uh, they had a lot to offer, and Princess Sebela was, you know, a, as you saw in the film very articulate and, and, and spoke beautifully and, and, and uh, very movingly about her experiences. Um, but uh, I think, you know, it's a shame. I wish, I, I wish more of them had written, you know, Princess Sophia passed away yeah. earlier this year. I wish more of them had written things and had made films and had given interviews so that we would have it on the record. Um, you know, it, it always makes me very sad when people pass away and nothing um, of their experiences is left behind because these people were gold mines. They were gold mines. Um, and, I'm going to do everything on on my end, but yes, by any means, if you have any of their ears, tell them any and all of them are welcome on the philosophy of art and and science. Absolutely. <laughs> and it's you did so great at expressing how great their ministries are, and I'm not just biased because it says Hiroth has my mother's name. It's a beautiful name, uh, Degwa. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but. It is another reminder that the whole raison d'etre for the communist revolution was this famine that they thought was being uh, neglected by the empire. And the truth is, could the Ethiopian empire have done more? I'm certain they probably could have done more. Um, but was part of this a sort of natural disaster yes and then what do they let out in the film the communist actually had a worse famine and that's where you get all the music i was just talking to my cousin about it he had no idea was it uh bon jovi and and michael jackson and all yeah, the like yeah. we are the we are the world, are the world. yeah wow. all the music yeah is I, you know, that they created was, a worse famine yeah, absolutely you know that was um i i remember um both famines i was very small when when the first famine happened but I, I obviously the revolution was an aftermath of that and uh it's covered in this film uh you you see um yeshi uh confronted with you know and because her father was the minister of agriculture at the time and they talk about uh the, the reaction of the government um the really poor reaction of the government of the day towards you know what was happening in wadlo but they also talk about how um that that horror that was happening was taken advantage of in order for the Dirk to come to power. How Jonathan Dimbleby had made this very moving documentary about the situation in in Wadlo, and how the Dirk took that film and spliced in footage of the emperor, you know, feeding his yeah. dogs and celebrating his birthday and so on, and made a very crude attack film about you know directed at at discrediting the emperor and the monarchy to bring him down. Um, but and yet, just a few years later, a decade, um, there was a much worse famine, probably the worst in in famine in in my lifetime, and certainly you know in in in, in anybody that I know's lifetime, um, where you know millions were starving, and a huge lavish celebration was put on for the tenth anniversary of the revolution, um, and with no consideration uh for all the people that were starving uh and it's interesting uh you know you you mentioned we are the world and uh there was a british version for you know a british song that came out uh called uh, do they know it's christmas 
um, for famine relief in Ethiopia. Uh, of course, we didn't know it was Christmas, you know, probably Ethiopia was celebrating Christmas long before the Brits were. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, we knew it was Christmas, but they put out this wonderful song to raise funds. Um, and, and, and then We Are the World came out. I was in, in high school at the time, and I remember a lot of my, you know, very generous American friends, you know, very worried for my family, offering to send canned food to, to Ethiopia so that they would have something to eat. I assured them my family was fine. But um, <laughs> yeah, you know, th that that famine has has become a, uh, that the, the famine from the mid 80s has become something of an identifier where Ethiopia has become identified with with hunger. Um, yeah. which is a shame because, you know, in 3,000 years of history, of course, we've had famines. We've had very bad famines. We've had years of plenty. We've been very great and we've been very poor. So, you know, it's sad that we have become identified with this one thing. But, you know, that was a, a big, big part of that was the, the lack of reaction from the Dutch and the regime at the time. Um, and, you know, we, we, we kind of are in a cycle of, you know, horrible things happening and and people in power basically ignoring them um and, and seeking things that glorify you know their rule whether it's you know huge parades and and, and huge military parades by the Derg or you know vanity projects today various vanity projects we see today while there's massacres and and and, and ethnic strife and terrible things happening um i i think uh you know, we really need to take a step back and look at our priorities. Um, I think it's, it's it's a serious problem. Very much so. And I, I grew up in the 90s where that was fresh in people's minds. And then you always have in the 90s, that's that's what everyone always asked me when I was in elementary school and and things like that. So, you know, I had to be the anti-stereotypical Ethiopian and try to lift as much weight and be as strong as possible. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so yeah. that stuff was dispelled. And when, when we think of that period, it is very interesting that one of the things that I liked that yes, she did in the film was she began reading the story of the Romanovs. And I'm wondering, is your historical interest restricted to Ethiopia or have you ever read the story of the, what happened to the, the Russian monarchical family which which seems you know decimated because she seems to draw some connections between her own family and that one um yes so uh you know my you know obviously i'm i'm very interested in ethiopian history and i'm i'm obsessed with ethiopian history but my obsession isn't limited to ethiopian history i am a huge fan of dynastic history gen generally so i have read a great deal and follow a great deal about the Romanovs and the Borbans and the Habsburgs and, you know, the, the, what is now called the house of Windsor or, you know, uh, the Brazangas who, who, or Braganzas rather, who ruled in Portugal and Brazil, uh, even the house of Savoy, which ruled Italy, um, you know, and, and the various Chinese dynasties and the Mughals in India and the Shakris in Thailand. I, I, I do enjoy, monarchical history very much and the Romanovs were probably you know one of the more interesting uh, particularly their fall um, a lot of people um, ha have made parallels between the fall of the Romanovs and the fall of the Solomonic dynasty in Ethiopia um, I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that you know Russia is an Eastern Orthodox um, country and and mm -hmm. Ethiopia was um, uh, uh, an Oriental Orthodox monarchy. Um, they were monarchs who believed in di divine right and were classified as absolute monarchs. Uh, you know, I, I have problems with that, yeah. that terminology, but um, people that the were, Oriental despotism, they, yes, that's how they always yes, talk about that, it. That traditional, that bad traditional in them, as they put it. Um, and those parallels are, are real and they're true. Um, but of course, there were very big differences in the situations. Um, particularly when, when you look at Emperor Haile Selassie and you look at Emperor Nicholas II of, of Russia, Tsar Nicholas II, um, I think, you know, they had very different 
um, they were very different types of people and they had very different reigns. Um, and the causes of the revolution in both countries might be similar in many ways, but um, it's as if the Russian revolution had happened during the reign of Peter the Great. Um, if you equate, if, 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 if you were trying to equate it, um, the situation in Ethiopia with Russia, it would have been as if Peter the Great had been overthrown. Um, Emperor Haile Selassie was a trans, more, you know, transforming monarch. He was, he, he, he did a, he, he was the catalyst for a huge amount of change and modernization in Ethiopia. He did more to change the system than any previous monarch. Um, Tsar Nicholas II uh, had no such record, uh, record of change. He succeeded a very conservative father. Um, Tsar Alexander III was extremely conservative. Um, his grandfather, Alexander II, was known as the Tsar Liberator. He had freed the serfs. So, and then ended up being um, assassinated by, uh, he, he had a bomb tossed in his carriage in St. Petersburg and was killed. He had an agonizing death. Um, you know, he didn't die right away. He was rushed back to the palace and his whole family uh, came rushing to the palace and found this man that was basically dismembered, die a slow, agonizing, horrible death. Um, and he was the liberator and revolutionaries did this to the liberating czar. So the next emperor, Alexander III and his son, Nicholas II, who were both in the room as Alexander II died, um, did not uh, you know, follow his path of liberalization. They were very conservative, uh, particularly Alexander III. So, you know, Nicholas II was, was very different um, from, uh, from Emperor Haile Selassie. And I think, you know, the revolutions, while similar in many ways, I think, um, I think it's, 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 uh, it misidentifies the scale. Um, for, for, for Emperor Haile Selassie to be overthrown uh, in a revolution and for Tsar Nicholas II to be overthrown in a revolution is, you know, very different. Uh, but what happened to the families? Um, you know, there's some validity there. Um, you know, uh, the, the czar and his family were machine gunned in a basement. Um, and then their bodies were, you know, tossed first, you know, in a pit, uh, then dug to, you know, dragged out and then buried under some railroad um, tile, you know, uh, rails in, a, in the woods uh, and kept there for, you know, decades before they were found. Um, the, the, uh, and the larger Romanov family, you know, they were either executed or driven into exile. And that's pretty much what happened to the Ethiopian uh, imperial family, too. They were driven into exile. Uh, many were killed. Many suffered under imprisonment for many years, a um, decade and a half on average each. Uh, and it was uh, a, a very difficult time. Uh, for them, uh, they did not have, you know, there were the, uh, there's all these stories of the of billions of dollars, you know, stashed away in Switzerland, and you know, you know, untold wealth, and the same was said about the Romanovs. But when you see the way these people lived after they went to exile, you you realize that this was all propaganda because um, there were no luxurious, you know, palaces and yachts for them when they went into exile. Uh, they lived difficult lives and they had to make a living and, and uh, they continue to do so um, and they live modestly. So, you know, there are there are a lot of parallels, but um, there are significant differences, too. I appreciate that distinction. You can draw the similarities, but there are points of distinction. And it seems, you know, the pioneer in this regard would have been Prince Salamayo, the son of Emperor Teodros. And the big difference there is that he had no sense of community and it was much, you know, not much further, but it was further in the past. And so even less connected, even more disjointed and who knows, you know, what exactly what those circumstances were. But as we talk about this, a, a week ago, I had a friend of mine, um, actually a chanter or a cantor in the Coptic church. And we were discussing that before world war one there was a multipolarity to the world meaning that multiple powers sort of had regional control and by the time 
that the Dirk would have taken over in Ethiopia in 1974, it's really a bipolar world between the Soviets, the USSR, who had overthrown the Romanovs and America. And by the time of TPLF, we can say it was really one world hegemon, which was America. And we're starting to see that hegemony fade for a little bit of the old world's multipolarity. But narrowing back in on that moment of 1974, there was a great question. I actually had the question, but somebody else asked it in the Q&A in Los Angeles of the film. And we heard Yeshi's take there for the live audience. I wonder what you would think. There was portions of the film talking about how Mangustu and perhaps others were militarily trained by Americans. But in general, it seems a lot of the blame that people lay is on the Russians and the, the Soviet-Cuban-Ethiopian connection. And they emphasize that. I have this thesis that it was American influence the whole time, uh, you know, perhaps looking for or claiming to look for liberalism and instead finding communism instead. I wonder, do you do you ultimately lay more blame at the Soviet feet or at the American feet in terms of fomenting the, the revolution? Obviously, it was a lot of Western trained Ethiopian elites themselves um that's that's a, that's a really good question um i I'd, I'd be very curious to find out what what yeshi how yeshi responded um you know she's 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 a character she's very interesting um i would love to have heard what she said but um you know from, from my perspective um i certainly think you know we we do tend you know because the dad was a you know uh a Marxist Leninist regime, you know, that believed in communism and was trying to set up a one party Soviet style government. Um, we do tend to blame the Soviets, but um, when you look at the, the, the ideological elites um, behind the Dark, um, behind the EPRP and behind Miason and all these political movements that, that, that brought you know socialist uh, government to Ethiopia, um, and you know, were often fighting among themselves. They were all Western educated. Um, the vast majority of them were people who had gone to school in the United States, in France, in the UK, in Germany, and had participated in, particularly in the 1960s, in the 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 very uh, radical student movements that were rising up, uh, especially in places like France, where there were, you know, huge protests and, you know, uh, a lot of unrest. So there was a, Marxism had become very fashionable in the West. And these Ethiopian students who had gone to the West brought a lot of that back with them. Um, so, and and when you look at the, you know, the, the as you mentioned, that multi, that multipolar world that existed uh, before World War I, um, turning into the two superpower system that emerged after World War II, um, you see that uh, the United, neither the, U, the US nor the USSR uh, were particularly uh, fond of monarchy. Um, I think, mm -hmm. you know, as recently as the, 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 the fall of the Taliban in, in, in Afghanistan, um, the proposal which was supported by a lot of, of, of Afghans to restore King Mohammed Zahir Shah uh, to, a, to the Afghan throne was, was responded to by the U.S. Uh, <laughs> regime as, oh, you know, the, we don't do kings. Um, yeah. And the same was done in Iraq. There was a call for, you know, uh, these, the, the, the feeling was that these elders who, who would come back and bring society together, these, these father figure leaders who might be above politics, might have a role in, 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 uh, in bringing reconciliation and mediating between, you know, uh, rival interests uh, that have a historic link and a sense of duty to these, these, these people in these countries, that they would somehow, you know, be helpful. And, and there yeah. was certainly an idea, you know, uh, a belief along those lines in both Afghanistan and Iraq, and the U.S. said absolutely not. Um, 
because the U.S. doesn't <laughs> do kings. So no, nor you know, generals in Egypt or Myanmar. Yeah, and 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 so you end up with people who are driven not by duty, not by a sense of tradition and 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 responsibility, but people who are driven by ambition, and and who mm -hmm. are 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 solely motivated by either you know power or you know for itself or popularity to get to that power and it's not necessarily you know to the benefit of the societies that exist so you know the us on one hand does that and on the other hand the ussr of course has a mission an ideological mission towards communism so i think i think there was a um almost a, a, a an a unintentional collaboration um, between East and West in moving Ethiopia in the direction that it went. Um, as you know, uh, when the, the Somali Republic, the Republic of Somalia at the time, um, invaded the Ogaden, tried to create greater Somalia, uh, they had been uh, for, for many years a very strong Soviet ally and the Ethiopia under Empire Selassie had been a strong U.S. ally. And so when Ethiopia was invaded by Soviet ally Somalia, what happened was they actually switched. The U.S. went to supporting Somalia and the Soviet Union poured its resources into Ethiopia to help preserve this, this communist style revolution that was happening in, in Ethiopia, they poured in the resources and the Cuban doctors came and the do Cuban soldiers came and uh, yeah, crazy. they switched, they switched. Uh, it was almost like a chess game. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, a, a lot of people, you know, have said that uh, the, the, the lack of interest in, in the U.S. in propping up or helping to, 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 to prevent Ethiopia from going into the Eastern Bloc camp was motivated because you know for many years they had a listening station at Kainyo at uh Kainyo, the Kainyo station base in Asmara and that that had become obsolete that they no longer needed that listening station uh and that uh American forces were more interested in maintaining their presence in Diego Garcia which is an island in the Indian Ocean and they had listening posts closer to the U USSR and to those shipping lanes that they used so um, they didn't need it anymore. So they really didn't care what happened. Um, and, you know, so we, we ended up uh, basically pawns in a global uh, chess game. Um, and, uh, you know, sadly, Ethiopia is not the only country that that happened in. Um, a very different revolution was, was brewing in Iran. Uh, the, the U.S., of course, abandoned um, their allies there. Uh, and now probably you know, uh, probably regret it in a sense, but I don't think, I don't think the U.S. ever um, was willing to, to, to stand by its, its allies there. Uh, they basically did what they did to, uh, in Afghanistan, um, you know, just basically left uh, their allies to their own devices. Uh, so, yeah, um, I, I think there has been a bad record uh, as far as the West and the East in, in, in the third world in Ethiopia and Asia. And um, I agree. I think that that multi-power world is on its way, is back on its way into the world system. I think we're seeing, you know, with, with China and, 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 and a more assertive Russia and other countries like Turkey um, and, and, and Nigeria and uh, other places where, where, you know, increased wealth, increased power has um, Israel, you know, the, the uh, United Arab Emirates, more assertive foreign policies uh, coming out in the world. Uh, I think you'll see the old traditional bipolar systems slowly evolve into something much more multipolar. One can hope. And um, I don't know if there's an Ethiopian or Amharic version of Animal Farm, but I, I sure hope that if it doesn't exist, someone makes it exist. You know, and... I, I'm not sure that, I, but I think it might have been translated. I know it was forbidden during dark times, and my dad said I really needed to read Animal Farm, so he took me to a bookstore, and I remember they were literally taking it off the shelves as I picked up a copy. Um, it had just been banned. Uh, 
So I got a copy and I read Animal Farm in Ethiopia as a kid. <laughs> so, in English or in Amharic? In English, in English. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I think I just found one right now. Yeah, in Sasat Idir, okay. Animal Farm. There you go. Balema Faisa Chiksia. Oh, interesting. <laughs> so someone's done it. And yeah. uh, I, I've i never committed to reading because of the impressive size of it. Uh, is it in Yanna Vyotu? What's the name of Fasad Dastas? Uh, uh, I, I think that's that i think that's correct i think that is yeah story. yeah us and the revolution i i've only ever read the one page where he mentioned saving my grandfather's life so that's the you know broken clock is right twice a day that's that's <laughs> the one moment that i could tip my head to him and and appreciate with obvious bias uh, but you know maybe i need to or someone out there who's uh, quicker than me can uh read it and, and translate it so that people get to read a lot more of that history in in english my last thing i want to ask you about this film before we move on to your your personal project which is larger is there was a question that i i, I shared with you that was someone else's question the question that i asked her was about Ras mangesha siyum who is still alive i believe in his 90s i i don't know his uh his whereabouts but uh i've heard him say two different things about the Welkite question. And it seems at one point, maybe he was pressured to say something, but at another point, it seemed that he was being more candid and telling what I believe to be the, the truth that it was never Western Tigray, it was not Shura. Um, and I, I personally know that she had filmed so much and there's so much extra footage and if they just released all of it, like, man, I would pay money and I would just watch it all. Yeah, and, I, yeah. and I'm sure there are a lot of other people that are like me. But the two that I really wanted to hear from were Professor Musfin, who was, if I'm not mistaken, arrested by the three regimes. <laughs> uh, and then Ludras Mangesha, who, you know, has found himself across many regimes as well, you know, to the point where... Uh, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, there's a great picture of him online, like greeting him in a very yeah, honorific. Kissing his hand, like yeah, old school kissing the prince, uh, the prince's hand. Yeah, no. Um, and so I'm wondering if you'd seen any of that footage, or if there's any of the extra footage that that you would really want to see. I would really want to see that footage as well. I really would. Um, you know, they did speak to a lot of people. They interviewed many people. Um, they they interviewed me. They, they, there was a lot of footage of me that didn't make it into the film. Uh, they, Ras Mangesha is probably at the top of my list as well. Um, not just for the issue of 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 Walgayet and Samin and and uh, Agadi, but um, you know, just you know, he's such a towering figure in Ethiopian history. Yes. He did so much, and he saw so much. And you know he was he was last the first... living duke, right? And he's yeah, like an arch. Yeah, uh, would living, you call him an, uh, an arch duke because he's yeah, Lu'ul yeah, Ras? Yeah, um, yeah, that's a good way of, of saying an archduke, I guess. Uh, Lu'ul means prince, and Ras is duke. And uh, you know the the heads of the cadet lines of the dynasty were all given this title of Lu'ul Ras to replace the kingly title that that the emperors no longer wanted to give out to the to to the subsidiary king <laughs> like the king of Gwajam and king Gwajam of the kingdom of Gondor yeah kingdom of uh, Sion and Gondor as well you know um so they, they, they I didn't know Gondor had it I just seen Ras so and what happened much. was you know uh, emperor Johannes was king of was emperor of Ethiopia and king of Sion Sion being northern Ethiopia you know based in Aksum right so Sion was overlord, basically, or, or you know, the, the, the covered Tigray, and um, and and the lords of of Wedlo and Gondar would report up to Sion. Okay, so uh, and then there was Shah and there was Gojam. So when when Emperor Johannes died, um, Emperor Menelik never crowned a king of Sion, and this was a big problem between him and Ras Mangesha, and then Mangesha Johannes, the first Ras Mangesha. And, uh, you know, eventually Mangesha Johannes went into rebellion and he was, you know, put under house arrest in Ankobeth and lived out his days there. But um, the descendants of Emperor Johannes in two lines, the, the, the Arya Selassie line and the Mangesha line, were given their own portions of Tigray to rule. And, um, then came Lichi Yasu. After Minlik died, 
Liji Yasu decided to crown his father, uh, Ras Mikhail of Wadlu, as king of Zion. And it caused massive offense in Tigray uh, in particular. Uh, and in Gondar too, because when you, when you consider uh, Ras Mikhail, he was a very devout Christian, but he was a Muslim convert. And he was from a dynasty uh, uh, that claimed to descent from the Prophet Muhammad. And to many of these people, <laughs> you know, this was something that was just, you know, the king of Zion? No, no, you know, the, the, this, this was too much for them to, 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 to digest. So um, Nugus Mikhail uh, was, you know, th th there are many ways of, of uh, that he's been described. And one of, you know, he's he's been described as very impatient, but also very diplomatic. And what he did was he used the title King of Wadlu. Even though he had been crowned King of Sion, he used King of Wadlu, and he was overlord of Tigray and Gondar. So, um, of course, Liji Yasu fell. Nugus Mikhail was, was placed under arrest, you know, for, for trying to restore his son. And, uh, you know, the, you know, Empress Zauditu became empress, and uh, the Jazmach Tafari Mokonin was raised to Lu'ul Ras, made crown prince and regent. So the elder prince of the House of Sho at the time was Raswal Dagur Gizabuyi, who was Emperor Malik's first cousin, Ras Mokonin's first cousin, Empress, uh, empress uh, Zauditu's and uh, uh, crown prince Tafari Mokonin's first cousin once removed. So they you know, he was the senior figure in the family, and it would have been more um, in line with tradition for him to be regent rather than the young Tafari Mokonin, who has been now crown prince and regent. But because they weren't going to make him regent, um, one of the reasons being his wife was the uh, niece of Empress Aitu and the, the political... Uh, chess game that was being played at the time was to try to keep Empress Taitu and her family as far away from the reins of power. Uh, they Which is appoint... funny because Princess Tananyawak, Princess Sebla's mother, who you mentioned earlier, yes, actually tried to reconnect to that. that... <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and the, 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 the other connection that's very interesting is that Emperor Haile Selassie's only niece, Yishashwar Kilma, and her and his nephews, their mother was another niece of Empress Taitu. So the, the, the connections were, were plentiful in uh, Princess Yishashwar. And Ras Mangesha himself through Cafe Betul, who yeah, you posted there you about. Go. Cafe Betul, yeah, you know, the, 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 the Empress Taitu's family had married into the aristocracy very widely. Um, so... Raswal de Giorgis was made Nuguswal de Giorgis of Gondar. So, again, to keep the descendants of Emperor Johannes, you know, happy with not um, giving that Sion uh, title to a northern king, uh, they gave him Gondar. And, uh, you know, it, it's not widely known, uh, but when, you know, after he died, uh, when, when the Mahal Safari soldiers, uh, protested, you know, trying to ensure that Emperor Haile Selassie's path to the throne was not, you know, he was constantly challenged as, as crown prince and, and regent that the more conservative nobles tried repeatedly to try to get him removed to ensure that. Famously, because... his cousin did not, right? The other, the other uh, Ras, uh, Ras Casa, Lula Ras Casa, right? Not Lula... to be confused with Jazmach Casa, but... Right. Uh, Lula Ras Casa actually was, was a very strong supporter of, of Ras Tafari Mokonin. Um, there were others, um, uh, not so much members, well, there were members of the royal family that were not as cooperative as Ras Casa, but um, there, that is, you know, most most notably, I think the Jalmach Balcha was one of the people who attempted, you know, to 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 remove uh, the Jalmach uh, or then, you know, Lul Ras Tafari Mokonim from power. But these Mahal Safari soldiers, who who were the kind of the central government's army, um, you know, protested. They actually led a demonstration through Addis, which is the first political demonstration that we know of, demanding that uh, the crown prince. Uh, be made king. And uh, this was not something that had ever happened before. Um, you know, there had never been political demands from a, you know, from an army made to the government, which is led by the person who they're actually supporting, right? And um, by all accounts, Empress 
Zodit was very offended. She was very offended that that people would want to impose a king in the capital where she was queen of queens, of uh, queen of kings. So, you know, she acquiesced and she crowned him as king. Um, but even uh, the now Nugu Stafari uh, wrote a, a piece that, that was published that, that warned against public political demonstrations and said, actually, you know, ironically, since we were just discussing it, giving an example of what happened in Russia. You know, look what, what you know, when these public demands, look what it did to Russia where the emperor was, you know, overthrown and killed. You know, we can't really do this was basically what he was telling his, his own supporters. Um, but when he was crowned king, uh, he was actually, uh, at the empress's insistence, was crowned king of Gondar. But he, that wasn't part of the wow. proclamation. He was made. He he didn't allow it to be made part of the proclamation because he needed to remain in Addis as the regent. That was his power. So if he was king of Gondar. He'd have to go to Gondar. Um, so he he wanted to stay where the power was. So in the proclamation, there were there were many um, there the, the, there were many uh, uh, things that they had to agree to. Um, he wanted to be crowned in church. She refused. Uh, she crowned him in the palace, uh, and then he went from the palace to church uh, for a service, um, because he was crowned king. He wasn't being crowned emperor, um, and he was crowned king of Gondar, but that was, it did not make the public proclamation. Um, but uh, you know, eventually, when he became emperor, uh, it was important. He, he followed basically the policy that Emperor Menelik had followed before him, um, where Menelik did not crown any kings. He recognized the one king that remained from Johannes's time, who was the king of Gojam, Nugustak Lahaymanut, but he did not crown any new kings. Um, and Emperor Haid Selassie did the same thing. He was the last person to be crowned a king of a, of a regional uh, kingdom. Um, and then after him, the title of king was replaced by the title of Lu'ul Ras, which was given to the heads of all the cadet lines, which was a very long way of getting back to Mangesha Siyum, Lu'ul Ras Mangesha Siyum, who, um, yeah, who has a lot of things that are very interesting that we I would love to hear from him. And I'm glad that they have the footage and maybe someday um, they'll, you know, that'll be released in some form. Um, but yes, he, there, there were, there was some controversy uh, about what exactly he said about um, the regions, the disputed regions in northern Big Gimda, which are identified today as as uh, Western Tigray, uh, you know, which is a new term. Um, Western Tigray, as far as you know, the old maps are concerned, was is is Shire and the Selassie Adwaq. So that area is 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 Western Tigray, not Welkait Semin. All of that has been associated with. With Big um, or as as a separate entity, um, you know, yes. once it has a long history, Semin has a long history as a separate entity. Now, I, I think you know one of the statements he ma made um, was that uh, Tigray ended at the Tekaze River. That that was the boundary of Tigray, which is basically what many people have been arguing on, on the side that you know this is Big Gemidir, not not Tigray. Um, I think where the the um, the problems that people find with some of the other things he said, he 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 may have been asked, well, what about you know across history, has this area never been part of Tigray? And um, you know, the, the, it's 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 an interesting question. Um, was it part of Tigray? No. Was it ruled by people who rule, who also happened to rule Tigray? Uh, yes. yes, that has happened. Uh, the Jazmas uh, uh you know, ruled, you know, he was the Lord of Agami all the way in Eastern Tigray, and he ruled all of Tigray and most of Northern Ethiopia, all the way Eritrea. He, the, he ruled a vast area, the uh, Jazmas Sabagadis, during the Zaman of Masafent. Raswalda uh, Selassie, the same. Ras Mikhail Suhul, the same. They were overlords over vast areas that included, you know, Gondar. Ras Mikhail Suhul ruled from Gondar. He was a ruler of Tigray. Does that make the city of Gondar part of Tigray? No. Um, but they shared a ruler at one point. So, you know, there are um, interesting 
approaches that people are taking to try to make claims to territory uh, that are not exactly legitimate. And I think, you know, he, um, he, he tried to answer the questions as best he could. Uh, but yeah, you know, uh, we don't know if there was pressure behind it. We don't know if he, you know, was just trying to express the fact that yes, some people who ruled parts of Tigray or all of Tigray also ruled parts of these areas as well. But does that make those areas, you know, Western Tigray? That's 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 questionable. Um, but you know, yeah. I've, so that was my that would have been my question to him, along with general governance questions about what was governance like under the monarchy, because we have a living uh, witness or testimony. In in case uh, you know, <laughs> I don't know to say His Highness His Majesty. In, in case the Archduke is listening to the podcast right now, what question would you ask him? Well, you know, I. Uh, I've I've uh, I've I've often wanted, you know, my my questions actually are 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 less about um, you know territorial questions and so on, and more about um, you know uh, the way people of his generation and his class how they identified themselves, just so that people today know how they identified themselves. This is a man, you know, who was born, you know, uh, in, from a from from. from you know, identified as a Tigrayan line of the imperial dynasty, although as as we stated before, it's a cadet line of the Gondar line. Um, but you know, uh, how did he identify himself? This is a man who was you know born into that family uh, and, and lived and worked in. You know, he's the person that established the city of Hawassa, um, all the way in the south. Wow, you know, he know established that. that city. That city did not exist before him. Um, he, he went back a few years ago for the anniversary of the founding of the city and was given a whole, you know, Sidama outfit and so on. He was one of the key people in the formation of Ethiopian Airlines. He was one of the key people responsible for the construction of Africa Hall and where, where the OAU was fought, founded uh, in Addis Ababa. So he had, you know, he played uh, a big role during those those years and then he served as as, as governor of Tigray after his father passed away as a Lul Ras uh, he was married to the emperor's granddaughter princess Aida Desta um, you know he he uh, he and then when the Derg came he led the first resistance against uh, against the Derg he led a a, a right of center political movement um, to to overthrow the Derg the, the EDU um, which later fractured, unfortunately, and you know didn't quite work out for various issues. It, it was democratic right of center. It, it was democratic right of center. It was you know identified as monarchist, but was not officially monarchist. Um, clearly, the, the I, I would say the majority of its members were monarchist. Uh, it didn't you know actually state that it was, uh, but it was right of center. You know, um, you know, private property rights and 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 uh you know upholding tradition and democracy and so on in ethiopia um anti-communist clearly um but it fractured and Beautiful. it fell apart um you know almost immediately it was confronted by the tplf in tigray um so ras mangesha siyum has had a very difficult and complicated relationship with the prdf regime in ethiopia um you know uh they they did not did not hide their hostility to him, um, you know he, he he's an interesting figure and there's just so much I would love to ask him about you know the the, the founding and the, the the development of the EDU and his perspective about the EDU because there is a lot of controversy there they did fracture they did fall apart I'd like to know about you know his perspective on that um, and uh, you just all the history that he's seen and all the the small stories that we don't know about, you know, being royal in Ethiopia in those days, you know, you, uh, he, he, he was, he's a fascinating person. Um, and, uh, he's absolutely. And I forgot that element that you were saying about how he was married to Ayla Selassie's line as well. I yeah. know he has grandkids and, and great grandkids. I, I've, I've even seen, I think one of his great grandkids, like an actor in Canada. And in my yeah. head, I was like, oh, they should do some, some Ethiopian, like, TV yeah. series or, or film series, but there that means I don't know if that's from uh, Princess Ida, but would that make his descendants like from Emperor Johannes and uh, Emperor Haile Selassie like double emperor descendants? So, so yes, so his 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 children 
are great grandchildren of Emperor Selassie and grandchildren of Princess Tananyork through their mother, uh, Princess Aida. Uh, so they are members of both the Shoan and Tigrayan lines. And um, interestingly, there's uh, his his elder sister, Princess Weleta Israel, was married to Crown Prince Asfawesen. Crown Prince Asfawesen uh, and and Princess uh, Weleta Israel were the parents of Princess Jigaygyo, who married the heir to the kingdom of or the principality of like Alakemt in in Walega, the Jalbach Fikrasalasi. So their children are, you know. Oromo, uh, Amhara, and Tigrayan um, royal lines. So, wow. you know, it, 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 that's a whole other topic. Um, you know, the art of political marriage in Ethiopia and and the um, the interconnectedness. But it's of, an Ethiopian tapestry. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know that 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 the elites had that intermarriage and that 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 very delicate um, um, network that helped. Um, the country exists for 3,000 years. You know, these marriage alliances were very important in keeping the country together. Um, and Empress Aitu was, was a consummate artist in, in that. Um, I, I think, you know, I, I, don't, I, I think there are very few people who could compete with her as far as the wisdom of her, of her political thinking along those lines. But yeah, Rasman Gesha, I think, would be fascinating to talk to along those lines. Um, you know he's uh, he's still with us, and I, I he he has a book out. Um, I don't think it's been translated into English, but the Amharic book, his book, is fascinating. It's a really good re read if you haven't read it. I encourage you to. I haven't. Is it a memoir of a certain it's, period, it's, or it's is a it memoir? It's um, it's basically from from his uh, from you know his childhood up to the present. Um, he he focuses mostly on the time period when he was you know working as a um, an official of the imperial government and, you know, a regional governor and so on, um, Ethiopian Airlines. Uh, but there are interesting uh, insights into uh, periods like the first Wigiani uprising, um, which interestingly, you know, tried to put him on the throne in place of Empire Selassie. It was a, it was a, you know, people talk about ideology and, you know, oh, it was the beginning of ethnic policy. It was, it was actually, a nobleman's rebellion um, against a new tax structure it was a tax rebellion. Uh, people did not want to be taxed the way the emperor wanted to tax them. So they said, you know what, uh, we're rising up and we're going to put Mangesha Siyum on the throne. He was in the Jazmach Mangesha Siyum. And, um, you know, he was he he had to stand trial in front of the emperor for for his role in that. He and he, you know, he isn't shy about, uh, you know, saying exactly what happened and and, uh, you know, very interesting things. He he talks about his deep appreciation for the Jazmach Kabbada Tasamma, who acted as his guardian during that trial. Uh, he he stayed with him, and he said he was like a father to him. Um, and you know, it's it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a it's a fascinating book. I don't want to ruin it for you. You you should yeah. definitely read it. Um, but I he's want to, and I just person. had the Jazmach Kabbada's grandson, who's an Amharic poet, on my program. Oh, there you go. Um, the Jazmash Kabeda's uh, wife is a relative, uh, was a relative of mine. And so, um, yeah, I... Uh, His uh, daughter was not my blood relative, but my aunt, my beloved aunt that went to school with my mother. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, we, uh, it, it's, uh, the Jazmash Kabeda's book, by the way, if you ever um, get your hands on it, is a must read. It's a must read, uh, not just about the Italian occupation and his activities there, but earlier things about the reign of Empress Z Zoditu and court uh, practices and, 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 and etiquette and so on. He has diagrams about how people are seated in during uh, Gibber, where the Empress uh, Zoditu sat and where, the, you know, Crown Prince Tafari Mukonnen would sit and who was, he'd had charts as who's authorized to sit at the same missile with Empress Zauditu. All these very interesting things that you, you know, would otherwise be lost if, 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 if he hadn't been there to put all this very interesting information down. Um, I need to. And I think his son Mangesha also has a book out. Oh, yeah. 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 So yeah, many. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting family, you know. Um, Dr. Kasaka, but uh, um, it was a fascinating person. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, the, 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 the history is actually the story of, of uh, is often the story of families. 
Um, and a lot of these people and their families contribute so much and their stories help build the larger picture about what was going on um, in those times. And it doesn't have to be big aristocratic families either. You know, yeah. your average uh, family down the street could also, you know, give you a lot of insight into how things were. Um, and, and from what I understand, the Jasmach Kabbada was one of those meritocratic people that entered the aristocracy, although I don't know his full background. Is that is that accurate? Um, so, you know, Dejjal Machka Bede was was an aristocrat's aristocrat. He was a court, he was a courtier. You know, he um, he was brought, he was raised in the palace. Um, you know, his his family background, you'll you'll hear a lot of stories about his family background, none of which I can confirm yeah. or deny. Um, <laughs> yeah, I had his grandson talk about the Mangasha talked publicly, I think, for the first time on another program. And, was uh, he speaking about the supposed parentage of Mangustu? Well, yes. There's, there's another that 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 that's pretty much been discounted. You know, you know, is he his grandfather? Is he his father? What you know, all that. Yeah, that's its own controversy. But Why was he spared from all the executed from all the aristocrats, things you know that, that happened? Yeah. But there's an, actually, a, 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 in in my view, a more interesting rumor. Um, you know, uh, that 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 uh, that Dejaz Machkabeda Tasama and Rasburu. Uh, that the two of them were actually illegitimate children of Emperor Menelik II. Um, mm -hmm. And it's it's a long-standing rumor. Um, people often point to the physical similarities that have been passed down from Menelik down to Jasmach Kabbada's family. Um, is it true? I mean, short of a DNA test, I don't know. But the, the rumor was there. Um, and it was not a... It was not a it was not a small rumor. It was, it yeah. was, you know. Um, I just was wondering about it because I saw him elevated to governor of Gojam, but I know that wasn't his hereditary title. So no. I, I had not. That, you know, uh, Gojam was, was uh, after the removal of uh, Ras Hailu Tekla um, Gojam was, was, was a, uh, was a problem uh, as far as governance. Um, that there was a very strong loyalty to that line, which had been, there for centuries. Um, and in Prahid Selassie had a policy, uh, a modernization policy, basically, where he would appoint people to areas that they were not native to um, as, as governors. Um, yeah. He thought that it would be, um, there would be less nepotism and, um, you know, more efficiencies that way, um, which is part of the reason why you found Ras Mangashasi Yuma as Dejan much all the way down in Sidama, or Sidamo mm -hmm. back then, uh, you know, establishing a, a, a new capital at Hawasa, uh, you know, when he was Tigrayan. Of course, Tigray was the exception to this because of their descent from Emperor Johannes. Eventually he did, you know, his father was still alive at the time. Once his father died, he was placed in Tigray. But outside of Tigray, um, the practice was largely to move people around and to, uh, you know, the 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 uh, traditional nobility took a back step. Um, during Emperor Selassie's reign, where he did promote a lot of these humble-born uh, people um, to, to, you know, more prominent roles. Um, but, you know, I think, uh, you know, it, it, when you go across, um, you know, Wellega was another exception, uh, like mm -hmm. Tigray. Wellega, you saw either the Jazmach Kasa, well, Damariam as governor, he, he served as governor there as well, or they just much as as uh, as governors there. Um, they were royal in laws. Uh, they were local royalty in Wadlaga, and uh, that was seen as something that would promote um, a peaceful uh, administration of those areas. But other than, but outside of those areas, um, non natives were often um, appointed to. Positions of responsibility. They just much uh, Salamun Abraha was governor of Wallo, uh, you know, under the crown prince. Eritrean so, and well, yeah. Tigrinya speaking, let's say. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I know. I know in, in the Eritrean case that having a show and ruler there and other policies probably built up some of the animosity that led to that civil war beginning in the 60s and culminating and crescendoing in the 90s there through the three regimes. Um, I think we spent a good amount of time talking about this, what may be arguably the most existential moment in Ethiopian history, in this long 3,000-year history 
that we're talking about, but there are a ton of these moments and you've covered so many of them on Tariq Amba as a reminder for those in case, uh, or those who haven't seen or heard the first appearance, could you tell us what Yatariq Amba is so that they can get more and more of these delicious details as well as, as the big picture? And then as you as you do that introduction, I would like for you to talk about, you know, I, I know you have a video on Adwa as well as on Yakuno Amlak. And I think those are two of the most interesting existential moments. So maybe if you could give them a mouthful or a gursha of of Adwa and Yakuno Amlak as you sure. introduce them, Yatari Kamba. Sure, absolutely. So Tariq Ambao is my is my baby, basically. It's uh, Tariq, uh, for, for those who don't uh, speak Amharic, uh, Tariq means history, and Amba is the flat shape, you know, flat topped mountains that are um, very common in Ethiopia that were used as natural fortresses and citadels and were the sites of many strategic towns and important monasteries in Ethiopia, um, and also treasuries where you get, you know, the sheer you know, mountainsides around them protected them. Uh, so they were the site. They were they were the sites of very important uh, places in Ethiopia. So this literally means a mountain of history, right, or a fortress of its history. So uh, and that's what we have in Ethiopia. We have a mountain of history, and um, it's a podcast. It's uh, you know on on uh, if you search for Tarikamba on on uh, YouTube, you'll see a video version of the of the podcast. Um, and then if you go on Spotify, you will see um, a uh, an audio version of the podcast. So I need to be better about that. I only have 12 episodes on Spotify and uh, Apple. And yeah, Google, I, and I, I have 110 here. <laughs> yeah, and I, 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 I need to improve too. I have more on on, on YouTube as well. But, um, you know, and, and soon I will be on 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 the other platforms i am on spotify and anchor right now but i will be on uh, on apple and google and so on other podcast platforms but um so you know my my first episode um dealt with uh emperor kono amlak and the restoration of the solomonic dynasty uh you know and the events around the fall of the previous zagwe dynasty uh, Yukon Amlak was was transformative in 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 uh, in the sense that he brought back um, the Solomonic dynasty, which had ruled Ethiopia during the Aksumite period, um, and it was a it was a very important time in Ethiopian history. The year twelve seventy was the year that he mounted the throne. Uh, but there were two very important Ethiopian Orthodox saints associated with his rise to power. Uh, Abba Yesus Moa and uh, Abba Taklahemanot. Uh, Abba Taklahemanot is is probably the most famous Ethiopian-born saint. Um, he's revered his 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 monastery, which he established as Debra Azmo, which is now known as Debra Libanos, uh, was is a is a very important religious center in Ethiopia. Uh, the head of that monastery was titled the Ichegge. That title was first given to Saint Taklahemanot. Um, and the, uh, that is one of the titles of the Patriarch of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church today. So uh, he it just caused some controversy. Yes, yes. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting. Um, the the, 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 the uh, first Patriarch of Ethiopia, uh, Abuna Baslius, uh, had previously been Ejegi. Um, and no Ejegi was appointed after that, after he became patriarch, with the assumption that it had been that title had been subsumed into the patriarchate. Uh, but you know, subsequently, uh, Abuna Paulus uh, decided to, when he became patriarch, decided to resurrect that title as a subsidiary title, um, <laughs> and, and as well as Archbishop of Aksum. Um, so. Yeah. You know, uh, he's 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 not he, you know the Ethiopian patriarch is not unique in the world for having multiple uh, titles like that. Um, you know, I, I think uh, the 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 patriarch of Serbia and the Eastern Communion has is also patriarch of Peck, as well as Belgrade and all Serbia. But you know, the, uh, there are other other sees that have multiple um, titles, uh, but in Ethiopia. You know, Abu Nabalus was the first to take on those multiple titles, and it's been passed down to the present incumbent. But yeah, um, and there's still Abati. 
I know there's yeah. at least one so Sabate in yeah. the United States who I've seen active on the YouTube Hades de Gua show. I don't know if you ever watched it. Yes, yes. But that was the title just under the Chagge. In yes. Lubano. And, and, and uh, you know, the, the thing with titles in Ethiopia is once you receive them, if you don't receive a higher title, even though you've left that post and you've gone on to other things, you still maintain that title. Um, you know, uh, the... the the, the Nebraids are, are a good example. Nebraids of Aksum, we've had, you know, Nebraid in my lifetime, Nebraid uh, Dimitros, the, the Nebraid uh, um, Ermias, and then presently we have Nebraid Elias. We have, you know, several that could be alive at the same time. Um, One passed recently, and his wife is actually a parishioner at oh, my parish. Okay. And she was okay. very welcoming yeah. to my wife, greeting her in Tigrinya. Oh, as she came. Nice. Much yeah. better at Amharic. But yeah, still yeah. greeting her in Tigrinya and making her feel welcome. Yeah, yeah. And then we have the Nebreds at Addis Alem, which are not quite the same level as the Nebred of Aksum. Um, but yeah, so these these titles, you know, pass on. And but uh, you know, the, the, going back to Kono Amlak and and Saint Tekla Hamanut, uh, the other saint uh, uh, by Jesus Moa, uh, who um, was uh, at the Haika Stefanos Monastery. Um, and was one of the people who actually taught Abu Natek uh, uh earlier. Um, there, there are some, like you know, uh, some some scholars who believe actually that Iosus, that Abba Yosus Moa may have played the larger role in in convincing the Zagways off the throne and placing uh, Ikon Ramlak on the throne, uh, mostly because you know Iosus, uh, you know. Uh, uh, Haika Stefanos uh, is not far from Laliba. It's, cl it's close by. And Abba Yusmoa was very uh, influential at the Zagwe court. Abba Taklahamanot, on the other hand, um, had blood ties to Ikono Amlak uh, through his mother. Um, wow, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah, yeah. And when you look, you know, what, what I've explored in that in that episode, um, and it gets a little complicated because, you know, uh, it's... Uh, there's so many of them. A lot of the church fathers in that era and after, in the early Solomonic uh, period, were descended, um, you know, from this family uh, to which Emperor Kono Amlak's mother belonged. A lot of them. Um, so there was a network of 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 abbots of, of prominent monasteries that supported uh, Kono Amlak and helped him in his rise to the imperial throne. Um, and, uh, I, I, th there were other episodes that, uh, that come after about, uh, monarchs that came after, you know, the early Solomonic emperors and mm -hmm. the, 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 the instability that existed, uh, especially immediately after Yukon Amlak, when, you know, uh, the succession was not set, whether it would be from father to son, rather than from, you know, brother to younger brother, as that had been under the Zagways. Um, but when it was finally settled we have a you know a huge another huge monarch uh Amdus Yon the first another giant um who is responsible for um you know ethiopian borders approaching to what they are today the ethiopia that we see today is 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 um largely a reflection of what Amdus Yon extended ethiopia to be um and he he is by uh by most accounts, the greatest emperor of that medieval period. Um, yeah. the very, you know, the, his, he, he actually has uh, a couple of episodes, not just one episode. Um, uh, How far is that? Because I know um, I'm blanking on his name now, but the professor at, at Rutgers who has the book on uh, Barara, I think, has been trying to work against that. But I, I hear people all the time trying to attribute to Minilik everything as yeah. opposed to Amdesion, like trying to make to restrict as much as possible what is considered historic Ethiopia as much as possible to the Amharic and Tigrinya speaking provinces of today. So yeah, no, that's 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 interesting. Um yeah, everybody uh or for political reasons, many people have kind of attributed Ethiopia, today's Ethiopia, to the the um, activities of Minilik uh, II and his 
expansion into the territories of what is now southern Ethiopia. But what Minilik was doing and sanctioned by, you know, as emperor and previously as king of Shoah, sanctioned by Emperor Johannes IV, he um, was reclaiming territories that had long been claimed by, as Ethiopian territory. Um, the uh, I'm, it, it's 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 well documented, uh, not just by Ethiopian sources but but other sources, that uh, you know these states that these 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 states in what is now southern Ethiopia were vassal states to the to the emperors of Ethiopia, whether it is the old Sultanate of Shoa mm -hmm. or the old Sultanate of Yifat, um, and you know, eventually the Adal Sultanate, they paid tribute to the emperors of Ethiopia. And they did not do it just to the Sol uh, Solomonic emperors, but they paid tribute previously to to the to the Zagwes and in some cases to the late uh, Aksumite emperors. Um, so yeah, no, it, I think there's a political reason for people to say Ethiopia is, you know, 100 years old, uh, you know, Ethiopia as we know it today is only 100 years old, that it's largely the creation of Menelik II, it's, it's not true. Um, you, when you look at the record of Amdetsu, and when you look at the, you know, the very good written chronicles of, of Emperor Amdetsu, it's clear that he pushed the borders of Ethiopia well beyond what uh, some of these other um, people have ascribed to being Ethiopia proper. Um, the 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 Shoah Sultanate was very key in helping uh, Ikon Ramlak reach the throne. Now, Shoah Sultanate is distinct from the province of Shoah, which was a Christian entity. The Shoah mm -hmm. Sultanate was a was a Muslim Sultanate headed by a, a dynasty called the Maksumis, uh, which I cover in the uh, in the podcast, and they were very key in helping Ikon Wamlak uh, gain the imperial throne. Ikon Wamlak had very good relations with his Muslim vassals and with the rulers of Egypt until he ran into difficulties trying to get a new bishop, and that's uh, from from Alexandria, and that's when relations with Egypt and with his Muslim vassals began to t deteriorate, as you know. The, the foreign Muslim parties tried to encourage the Muslim vassals in Ethiopia to rise up against the Christian hegemony. So, you know, um, other than, than those early Solomonic uh, episodes, I've also uh, done a, uh, an episode to commemorate the Yekati 12 massacres by the fascists um, that came out uh, at the anniversary. Um, it talks about uh, the fascist invasion and some of the atrocities that were carried out. And uh, more recently, I've, I've started a series on Emperor Minilik II and the Battle of Adwa. I did an episode that's been completed and is on there um, on the YouTube channel uh, about the uh, lead up to the war. And then I am about, in the next couple of days, uh, going to release the episode about the war itself, about the hostilities, what happened, and the various battles that led up to the Battle of Adwa. And that'll be followed by an episode about the aftermath and what um, happened after. And then um, we'll go back to the medieval uh, period and we'll carry on from Amdez Yon to his successors. And I plan on doing it more consecutive um, episodes until we reach modern times. Um, then we will reach back, I think, to the Zagways, which deserves our own series, I think. Um, but Absolutely. yeah, I try to put in as much details, as much verifiable details as I can. I think that a lot of people appreciate the the details um, in in my in my podcast. Um, the, a lot of people didn't know about uh, some of these other dy dynasties, like the Walasmas and the Maksumis, who are very important in Ethiopian history. They're Muslim dynasties and they led vassal states, but they were very key in the in the development of, of the empire of Ethiopia. Um, and uh, you know, it's 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 uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, it, I feel like it's my child. It's a labor of love. I it's, I'm very passionate about its history, and I really enjoy you know the research as well as the recording of these things. Um, but um, I, I love questions, and 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 a lot of people have reached out uh, with questions, and I've had episodes where I have devoted just to answering people's questions and explaining things a little further, or you know, adding little anecdotes here or there. 
Um, but there are other. Is that open to the general public or there's just Absolutely. people who they are friends can, with you? They can send in their either by putting comments on the YouTube channel or sending me, you know, uh, you know, via social media messages, questions. I have a there's a Tarikamba Facebook page. Um, I'm on TikTok. There are little short videos on TikTok, you know, uh, you know, Ethiopian history uh, related TikToks. And I'm on Instagram as well uh, under the name Tarikamba, uh, aside from my own personal one. Um, but yeah, I invite people to follow and subscribe, you know, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook. Spell it for them. YouTube. Tarikamba, they, they should be able to figure it out, but just spell Absolutely. it out for them. Just T A R I K, Tarik Amba, A M as in Mary, B A, Amba, uh, Tarikamba. And it should be easy to find um, of the podcast, the video cast, and social media presence. Um, yeah, every time you speak, I learn a lot, and uh, I'm not a newcomer to Ethiopian studies. Uh, <laughs> <enough>. So, I, <laughs> so please, everyone, if you're a fan of my show in any way, go and listen to and watch Tariq Amba, and ask insightful questions like I do, so you can get him to explain further, especially the Taklahaimano details, very interesting to me. I, I had a suspicion, you know, I mean, going back to the ethnicity thing, like, you know, what are these? They're Shoans? Well, they come from Beit Amhara, which is now called Wallo, and yeah. before that, Aksum, and you connected it there. I know there are people who don't like to accept uh, that part of it, but the same as way you have um, all these descendants of aristocrats in the diaspora today there was a mini diaspora in that region then yeah and the, i don't think it's so much of a, a stretch we just i think some people have a drive not to believe certain things because as you said they have certain ideological predispositions that take them away from that for example there's that beautiful flag in your background which yes. is a, a great segue the lion of judah has conquered i can't actually read the writing but i assume it yeah, says it's, uh, something like it's that actually one of the military uh i think actually that one is the imperial standard but this the my my background my virtual background um on on on, on this interview is a photograph of holy trinity cathedral and if, if i turn around you'll see that there are other flags uh when you go into holy trinity cathedral in the nave high up there are military and royal banners that were that were set up um, to commemorate the liberation of Ethiopia um, in 1941 from the fascist occupation. And uh, that, it's a great segue. Um, Holy Trinity Cathedral um, was 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 built uh, by Emperor Haile Selassie um, because the the old cathedral for the city of Addis Ababa, St. George's Cathedral, was deemed to be too small for 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 large ceremonies. Um, Empress Zaudita was crowned there, and Empress Selassie was crowned there. Um, Arada Georgi's beautiful church, uh, one of the traditional round churches. But for Empress Selassie's coronation in 1930, and again for his Silver Jubilee in 1955, it had been necessary to erect a huge tent on one side of the church and have the ceremony there so that it could accommodate all the guests, especially the foreign guests that would come to attend the coronation and later the Jubilee. So it was decided, you know, clearly for the future for big state functions that involved a church service, there needed to be something appropriate in size and grandeur. Um, and so Holy Trinity Cathedral was dedicated. Um, it was begun 78 years ago. Um, well, it was begun in the 1920s, but what happened was the Italian invasion happened and construction stopped, and it was completed after the, the uh, liberation. And uh, in the years since, it was expanded twice uh, to make it larger. Um, and with each extension, um, you know, there were new plans, new works done, but there was never a wholesale um, renovation of this cathedral. There was patchwork done, you know, here and there a leak, you know, showed up and you'd cover the leak and, and you'd fix this and you'd fix that, but nothing, um, you know, comprehensive was ever done as far as renovations. And so the cathedral is in very dire shape. It needs a lot of renovations. 
And so um, a committee has been formed, an official committee um, sanctioned by the Ethiopian Orthodox Church and authorized by the Holy Synod uh, to raise funds for the uh, restoration of this cathedral. Uh, it's a historic cathedral. It is the national memorial for the liberation of Ethiopia. It's, um, you know, the people that are buried in the churchyard are people who either fought um, against uh, fascist Italy as resistance fighters or people who went abroad and fought from abroad as exiles. That is the burial spot for them. Also buried there are victims of the Yakati 12 massacre uh, where uh, Marshal Graziani massacred Ethiopians um, because of an assassination attempt against him. Um, there are estimates about 30,000 people were killed in that one massacre. Kidding, but so. um, there are other, you know, the imperial families buried in the crypt there in Prahid Selassie and Empress Menon are buried in the uh, northern chapel of the of the main part of the cathedral. Uh, and other prominent people uh, from Ethiopian society are buried in the churchyard. So, you know, it is a place of importance, uh, of national importance. Uh, it is the site where the patriarchs of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church are enthroned and where bishops and archbishops are consecrated traditionally. Um, and so it is religiously very important as well. Um, so we are gearing up to start a fundraising uh, drive to help uh, in this restoration. It's going to be massive. Uh, I, I believe the the estimate, I, I think the last estimate I had heard for a, a full renovation is 100 million bir, which is a significant amount of money. Um, so, you know, everyone, uh, who has a love of history and historic preservation um, sh is encouraged to to contribute. Um, we're not quite ready to receive uh, uh, donations yet. We're forming a committee, uh, but we will uh, be coming forward with uh, requests for help. And we're hoping that Ethiopians who love their country and love the Ethiopian Orthodox Church and Ethiopian history will help in preserving this historic monument. I hope so too. And it's good to ferment the thoughts like this uh, to manifest them before it happens. And of course, it is the great place which you personally saw so many patriarchs of Ethiopia and served the Ethiopian Orthodox Church yes, as a deacon. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you.